um, or push back off even any support response. So thank you. All right, looks like things are working. So in the sideline, I was speaking to Enes and I asked him to use Chrome. Now, I don't know if we should uh, thank the gods for making this finally happen, or maybe we should thank <laughs> Google for making Chrome. But Enes, the floor is yours, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I guess things are all right now. So I was uh, actually thanking the entire team that is listening now, I mean, everyone in the room, uh, for allowing me to be part of this. Um, so we, we are going through this um, talk, and um, it's, um, it's going to be delivered by me from an end, an end user point of view, being an end user of uh, computer technology. Um, I guess uh, people really got what my credentials are and uh, where I'm working right now. And um, just as I begin, I want to mention that I'm actually live from home and you know it's a full house and uh, anyone may pop in at any time, please, uh, my apologies for that and uh, uh, I hope you'll bear with me. So we, I'm going to talk about computers and how they unlocked and uh, you know, drove the evolution of uh, medical imaging. And so by the end of this talk, we will have gone through um, these uh, topics and uh, listed under the outlines. Um, in one way or another, we will have actually gone through that. It looks like it's a mouthful, but uh, I think I'll rush through the first part of the presentation because it's not very relevant, I think, to, uh, to you. Uh, so uh, I'll actually go through the part of um, general concepts of medical imaging uh, and how uh, images are created really fast so that we can move to the meat of this talk uh, where we talk about uh, uh, how computers have contributed to the evolution of medical imaging. And as we begin, let me begin, let me start by talking about a few of the abbreviations that you'll come across as we continue with the talk. Of particular interest uh, for this talk is uh, the CAD, which is the Computer Aided Diagnosis, um, the DICOM, which means Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, the PACS on your right screen, on the right hand of the screen, picture archiving and communication systems, as well as the RIS, which is a radiology information system. I think these are of particular interest for uh, the audience that we have uh, uh, for this talk. The rest will be actually given to you as we go on with the talk. And this is uh, the abstract which I gave, and um, I want to believe that uh, most of you must have had uh, um, access to see what I said uh, in this uh, abstract and what this talk is all about. But really, in my introduction, I want to say that, you see, medical imaging has been in existence, you know, since the last years of the 19th century. And for nearly a century uh, from, about 1895 when the x-rays were discovered, there was no much advancement in the field as it did in the last 47 years when computer technology and internet were integrated in medical imaging. And since in, in the last 47 years, we've seen unprecedented advancements in the medical imaging, you know, um, we have seen, you know, tremendous popularity of medical imaging, technological advancements in terms of applications, the speed of examinations, the accuracy of the machines, and, you know, vast amounts of clinical information which is being extracted from the images. And apart from that, I mean, computers have enabled, you know, storage of huge amounts of, uh, of volumes of images for future reference and um, their easy retrieval distribution across departments or institutions 
or across geographical regions, you know. But unfortunately, this has not come without uh, problems. There are issues to do with the cost, uh, support structures, capacity to handle such volumes of data and data security, especially that we are talking about confidential patient, you know, uh, information. And so really in this talk, we, we will take a, a qualitative approach to look at uh, uh, what computer technology has contributed towards uh, the advancement of uh, uh, medical imaging, where we are today, what the future holds, and uh, pre probably to bring especially technocrats like you on board to see how we can find, you know, lasting indigenous solutions for the problems that we face. Uh, especially for our country as Zambia. So really the objectives of this talk is to briefly describe how medical images are created, uh, to shed some light on how computer technology has unlocked and driven the advancement of medical imaging, and you know, to highlight the openness, you know, and I want to emphasize the openness of the future advancement in medical imaging. I would like to get feedback, is everybody on board? Uh, all clear on my end. I don't know about our other colleagues here. Correct. So I'll move on. And just uh, two definitions that I want to put across. Uh, I think people usually confuse these two terms. They may come, you know, as strange to you uh, as they look, uh, but you may have come across them. Really, when we talk about radiology, what radiology is, this is simply a, a medical specialty that uses medical imaging to diagnose and treat medical conditions. Medical imaging, on the other hand, refers to the techniques and processes that are used to create the images of various parts of the human body for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. So to somehow paraphrase uh, these definitions is to say that medical imaging is one of the components of radiology. Medical imaging provides the images of the subject, and that is the patient, that the radiologist uses to make a diagnosis and also in some instances to treat uh, the problem. So medical imaging really constitutes uh, the image acquisition, image processing, storage, a display, the archiving of the medical imaging and I mean medical images and their retrieval for future reference and use and the communication or distribution. So really radiology includes all the components of medical imaging and in addition to that there's the issue of interpreting these medical images, writing reports and conducting interventional procedures to manage some of the conditions uh, that are found in medicine. So how are these medical images uh, produced? Generally, um, the process involves generating some form of energy, mostly but not always in the form of uh, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, this energy is formed into a beam and is meant to propagate through the subject or the body. The energy will interact with uh, the body tissues and will be changed according to the structures that the energy propagates through. And it will be altered accordingly. It will be altered accordingly uh, depending on the structures as well as whether there is a disease process going on or not. The, this, this, this energy that interacts with the body tissues then exits the body on the other side. Within it, it carries a pattern of, you know, um, changes that is encoded of some sort of uh, the changes that have taken place in the body. As it is exiting the body on the other end, we have a detector that records the energy that exits from the body after the interaction. It is at this point that computer mathematical algorithms are used to reconstruct the image depending on how the beam of energy has been changed by the subject. 
So in order to have a, a medical image, you need three components. The first is the source of the energy, which is in this case mainly radiation, the subject or the patient, and the detector system. And then added to that, you need to have, you know, uh, a computational system that will put the data together and generate an image out of the data that has been collected. So um, there are two types really of, uh, uh, two categories, broad categories of the type of image that is used to generate medical imaging. So uh, they are divided into ionizing uh, energy as well as non-ionizing energy. Um, under the ionizing energy, we have those that are based on X-rays, such as the conventional radiography, which is the, the well-known X-ray. Uh, people simply call it X-ray. But we also have other modalities like mammography, fluoroscopy, uh, dual energy X-ray absorptionometry, and the famous CT or computer tomography. But we also have ionizing energy under the gamma ray um, of frequency such as um, positron emitting tomography, which is the PET there, and the single photon emission computed tomography. And these are under a subspecialty of uh, radiology called nuclear medicine. But we also have those uh, that um, do not use ionizing energy. These uh, include newer forms of modalities, such as the magnetic resonance imaging, uh, ultrasonography, the so-called ultrasound, and then we have endoscopy and thermography. But apart from that, in the recent past, somewhere in, in the late 90s, we have uh, new modalities that have emerged on the market, which are hybrids between the two, ionizing and non-ionizing, or uh, X-ray based and uh, gamma ray based combinations. Uh, such include a CT stroke PET or CT stroke SPECT. Uh, these are X-ray and gamma ray combinations. And then we have the MRI, MRI PET or MRI SPECT. And these are um, non-ionizing with uh, gamma ray combinations. So I'll just showcase a bit of some of the modalities that we have um, at uh, the university, university teaching hospitals, in particular the Department of Radiology and the Imaging Unit at the Cancer Diseases Hospital. Uh, first is the very common one that we've had for a very long time. This is uh, radiography, commonly called X-rays. And this is the machine that we have, one of the machines, digital machines that we have at UTH, uh, radiology department. This uh, insert here shows the actual machine. And on the right, to the right of that, we have the control uh, console for that machine. When we use that machine, you get an image like the one that is uh, shown here. And this is the famous chest X-ray. And I must say that this is um, a normal chest X-ray but we are not here to actually do the interpretation. The form of energy that is used here is X-rays and the source is the X-ray tube. Then we can have either film or digital detectors that will be used. And we can, as we can see here, we only find that uh, we get a, a two-dimensional image uh, for interpretation. Uh, the next that we have is fluoroscopy. Uh, fluoroscopy, uh, is similar to X-rays, except that it is dynamic. You can have a real-time image. Um, if you are looking at the heart, for example, you will see it beating uh, in real time. So we have a state of one of the state-of-the-art um, fluoroscopy machines with a special name called uh, the CAT lab, which is used at the moment for uh, intensive, you know, cardiac procedures to put uh, pacemaker, uh, pacemakers in the heart, you know, to treat some lesions or uh, problems of the heart, uh, to recanalize uh, blocked blood vessels and things like that. Uh, because we can do that real time, uh, visualization of the anatomy of the body. Uh, and you are able to see on screen, digital images on screen of uh, the anatomy that you are traversing. 
So this is the cat lab machine that we have at the University Teaching Hospital and uh, the control panel in the, in the next room down below. Next is um, the computer tomography, the CT scan. Um, again, this is a, a machine that we have at the University Teaching Hospital. This is the main machine, you can see the gantry, this is called the gantry, it, into which the patient is fed during the examination. And uh, this is the control uh, console for the machine. And to the left here, you see um, the images that are generated by the CT scan. Beautiful images. I mean, uh, you, you need to have radiological eyes to appreciate uh, what uh, these images can show. Uh, this is one of the advanced machines that we have and really, really helpful uh, in many different conditions. Okay. The next we have uh, <clears throat> nuclear medicine, which is based on uh, uh, gamma radiation. Uh, this is uh, um, the gamma camera that we have at the University Teaching Hospital and the control room here. And the images that it generates are shown here to the, to the left uh, of, of, of the images. And the difference in this is that whereas in the previous um, modalities we have seen that the source of the radiation is outside the patient from the x-ray tube. Here, we actually inject the source of radiation into the patient. So the patient himself will be emitting radiation, which will be passing through the tissues overlying the blood vessels where the, the radiopharmaceutical is, and it is detected uh, by the detector here and um, we count how much radiation we detect from particular points of the body and it will tell us where the disease process is occurring and where we have normal structures. Okay. This is ultrasound, again slightly different because this does not use ionizing energy, it uses um, a sound of a very high frequency beyond the human hearing range, that is uh, beyond 20 kilohertz, uh, which is beyond 20,000 hertz. And so it is non-ionizing. Uh, but when we use this machine, uh, we put the probe. This is called the probe. Um, it is a transducer. It's the one that inputs the energy into the patient, interacting with the patient, and the echoes are sent back from interfaces of structures in the body. And the probe will still pick up uh, the echoes as they return. And from that, a computer is used to generate image depending on the time that uh, the echoes are detected from the body. So it will be able to tell you how deep a particular problem is, what type of a problem it is. And when we do that, we are able to see um, images that are generated like what has been displayed here. Uh, as you can see, you may be interested to, to know that uh, this is a fetus lying in the womb uh, of a mother who was being scanned. You can actually make out the head of, of that fetus, the body and the limbs here. You can actually see that this is a face. In fact, you could actually make a three-dimensional image out of this and even a 4D uh, image from that. This is one of my most favorite. Uh, this is magnetic resonance imaging. The physics behind, you know, the, this machine is quite complex and very interesting. And um, we have one and it's situated at uh, the Cancer Disease Hospital. And uh, as opposed to the previous um, uh, modalities that we've talked about, here the energy that is used is a gigantic magnetic field and uh, radio frequency pulses. Uh, these are the types of energy that are used. So we have a superconducting magnet in the gantry of the MRI machine, which generates energy that is used to uh, generate images. Now, you can't tell but fall in love with the, the images that are generated from an MRI look at how much resolution, uh, this is the axial slice of the brain at the level of the basal ganglia. Um, you can see that this image has a lot of detail 
and very high resolution. Beautiful images, really. And this is a, a sagittal image of the foot of a patient. Um, it has so much detail and uh, the resolution that it is easy from the knowledge of the radiologist to be able to pick an abnormality from, uh, from the images. Okay, so the hybrid um, systems, as we have said, are a combination of two modalities, either functional or anatomical. When I talk about functional, I'm talking about uh, a nuclear medicine, and uh, when I talk, I talk about anatomical, I talk about transmission images like X-rays, a CT scan, and MRI. So here we have a combination of an MRI and a nuclear medicine image. When they are combined together, you get this type of an image, which is image C. The beauty about having hybrid systems like this is that whereas the MRI will only give you the anatomy, the nuclear medicine part of it will give you physiological changes such that in a combination of the two, you correctly map physiological disturbances in the body to the correct anatomy on the body of the patient. So you actually get um, twice as much information uh, from a hybrid system than you would uh, from uh, using single-handed. Uh, down here, this is an example of a CT scan combined with a, a, a nuclear medicine and you get an image uh, such as this one. You will be interested to know that in such images we have what are called hot and cold spots. So they have color-coded, um, these computer color-coded uh, images which will tell you where you have a lesion, where you have a problem in the body by it de being depicted by a bright color such as here. This is in the liver. You can actually see that uh, there's a problem in the liver. That's why it is lighting up. Okay. So how did we get to where we are now? I mean, when did these computers come in medical imaging? What I've given here is sort of a timeline from the time that, um, uh, you know, say medical imaging was born to about the time where we are now. So we see that, uh, you know, x-rays were discovered in 1895 by this gentleman called uh, uh, Conrad Wilhelm Roentgen, he was a, a German physicist. And uh, this picture here is uh, an example of um, the x-ray that he was able to make at that time. In fact, this is uh, his uh, wife's x-ray. I mean, the hand of his wife, you can actually see the, 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 the wedding ring on the, on, the, on the ring finger there. But that's where it started from. And from about 1895, we didn't really have much, you know, advancement in um, a medical imaging until here where I put a red line, you know, uh, in about the early 1970s, in about 1972, with the, the advent of the CT scan. This is when computers came really robust in, the, um, in medical imaging. And we see from, from that time, there has been tremendous advancement in the applicability of medical imaging and what you can do and how much information you can extract. And I've also highlighted here what happened in 1980, that there was also discovery of the digital detectors for the x-rays. Initially, these x-rays were recorded on, um, on plain films, okay? Uh, these are the films that we usually see people carrying, patients carrying like a big, you know, envelope with a, a black film inside. Um, they were recorded on uh, plain films, okay? But now we are able to record x-rays on digital imaging uh, detectors. So we see that uh, these hybrid systems came in, in about 1993. 
And uh, so now we can actually go on and look at really where we are with the entry of computers in about the early 1970s, where we have reached. So world over, we have seen that um, there has been rapid involvement of uh, computer technology. And uh, we see that even medical imaging has been evolving with uh, the evol evolution of uh, computer technology. We have seen that uh, there is increasing equipment. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a progressive decrease in the size of the equipment that we are using. But despite that decrease in the size of the equipment, we are seeing that there's an increase in the dynamics of clinical application of uh, uh, this equipment. And then uh, world over, we have seen that there's deep integrate, integrate, integration of the internet in, in healthcare. And when we talk about healthcare, that is inclusive of, uh, um, inclusive of uh, radiology. And then we have also seen that there's complete digitization of medical imaging and radiology systems. Um, this may not be so for our scenario here, perhaps in Africa or Zambia in particular, but generally there is complete digitization of uh, uh, medical imaging and uh, radiology systems. Uh, so we see that uh, there's also, we have the ability to archive images, patients' images digitally, we can process images, we can distribute the medical images, and we also have the privilege of doing what is called post-processing, where unlike the olden days, we are able to change the appearance of an X-ray after it has been acquired. Way back, if you didn't get, you didn't produce a very good film of the chest, the only way out was to go back and repeat it. But that meant increasing ionizing energy exposure to the patient. This time around, we have the flexibility to be able to post-process the image even after it has uh, been taken and uh, without having to bring the patient back. Um, aside from those advancements in uh, medical imaging, we have actually seen that we are able to handle huge volumes of data and manage them. Uh, departments and um, you know, centers, medical center, imaging centers are now running on uh, what I mentioned earlier in the abbreviations, the radiology information systems and the um, picture archiving and com uh, communication systems. Now these, the, the, the PACS, the PACS is in a, some sort of a distribution network that is used for storage and retrieval of medical images. Radiology information system is some sort of an electronic health record system that is used specifically for the uh, radiology department to handle issues like uh, scheduling of patients, um, appointments to the department, uh, to run, you know, billing processes, and, you know, to be able to link to the main electronic health records of the um, health centers so that you can retrieve clinical information for the patients. And also, you know, at the end of a, a periodic review, you can actually generate reports on your performance as, as, as a department, uh, what type of cases you are seeing most, for example, how many heart attacks you, you are able to detect in that review period. So it, the radiology information system does a lot uh, for the radiology uh, department. Now, apart from that, we have very important things as well, which may be very familiar to you, uh, like the artificial intelligence. This has not actually been left behind. It has penetrated through uh, medical imaging in that we now have the CAD, which is compute, uh, computer aided diagnosis. Through machine learning, we have seen that uh, um, a lot of conditions can be diagnosed by the PACS systems. Um, 
this is whereby, for example, if I give uh, uh, TB as an example, through exposure of the machines to the normal, for example, if we talk about the chest, TB, tuberculosis of the lungs, um, the machine is, you know, um, given, presented to it on what the normal lungs should be. That is the first step. After that, there's that recognition of the normal, then it, it will be able to determine what will be the abnormal. And when it reaches the point of what is abnormal, then it will start comparing because you have fed it with information to say, if you see this, what you are seeing is tuberculosis of the lungs. So there is that form of machine learning, which I cannot explain better than you can, but it has actually penetrated medical imaging and it, it, it is used in computer-aided diagnosis. Now, human eyes are limited about what they can see. So the radiologists may interpret, but the machine is more accurate. I mean, the computer is more accurate as long as you have exposed it to a vast number of examples from which to distinguish uh, problems. We also have um, uh, what are called radiomics. Radiomics, actually, um, the use of data characterization alg algorithms, you know, to extract large, you know, volumes of quantitative features uh, from medical imaging uh, or medical images, which can actually be used uh, by radiologists for uh, diagnosis. And then we have theranostics. Uh, theranostics uh, is uh, uh, some sort of a branch of radiology that is dealing with mainly um, oncology areas. And when I talk about oncology areas, I mean in cancer units where there's a combination of an, a radio pharmaceutical that is incorporated with a therapeutic agent. So when you administer to the patient, a cancer patient, such a combination, first of all, it will diagnose where the problem is, and at the same time, engage its therapeutic component to treat the problem. So this tends to work on uh, some kind of uh, a find and fix approach. Okay, so you'll be able to diagnose the problem and at the, at, at the same time, uh, treat the problem. World over, we also have um, interventional radiology that has um, uh, become very popular. And I'm glad and proud to say that we also have interventional radiology at the University Teaching of, uh, Hospital. And this is where a radiologist makes a diagnosis of a particular condition that he goes further and treats himself. So he intervenes in that problem at the moment, we do quite a lot of uh, procedures in the department where we have our cut lab, where pacemakers are um, inserted in patients' uh, <clears throat> hearts. Uh, we also have procedures like stenting, where blocked uh, uh, blood vessels, supplying blood to the heart, you know, are um, recanalized to allow blood to be passing. We also have procedures, especially very common amongst the ladies, we have fibroids. The traditional way of treating fibroids has always been um, a surgical operation. You open the patient and physically cut out the fibroids. We are now able to do uterine uh, embolization where we go and inject some chemical into the blood vessels that are supplying the fibroids, so as a way to occlude that, bless, uh, that blood vessel and starve the fibroid of its nutritional supply from the blood. And with time, it dies on its own. And so these are some of the uh, things generally in radiology that are you know, happening now in the world. When we come specifically to medical imaging itself, we see that the equipment is almost entirely computerized at this stage and they have advanced imaging techniques in almost all the modalities. The 
imaging times have been markedly reduced. If you look at the, the CT scan, you can actually image the brain in seconds. In fact, in milliseconds, uh, you can image the whole brain. Uh, so uh, we also have uh, advanced uh, image post-processing uh, procedures. The images are of very high resolution, especially those that are of the digital imaging, uh, uh, digital image communication in medicine, the DICOM. And this DICOM has actually become a standard format worldwide of um, storage of uh, medical images. And so if you have to distribute your images, you have to make sure that they are in the DICOM format for the other recipients on the other end to be able to view your images. Okay, and then we have specialized image viewing and reporting uh, equipment that are not only restricted to monitors to look at the images and interpret them. We also have voice recognition uh, machines so that it's easy for the radio radiologist to generate reports about what he is seeing in the medical images. So in summary, about where we are today, I tried to put um, uh, this graphic, which I believe you are all too uh, uh, knowledgeable about, I can't explain it better than you can, but really is we see that there's interconnectivity of uh, systems and centers. So we have the image acquisition centers, this is where you have your machines, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, fluoroscopy, mammography, name them, and they, you know, generate images and feed into the system where you can have, you can save your images, uh, interlink with the, you know, hospital information services, the radiology information services, and you have, you know, uh, image diagnosis centers, and this is where I am as radiologists, we sit there to look at the images and interpret them. But apart from that, you can actually distribute these images across you can send them uh, to colleagues, uh, you know, in different continent. And um, this is called teleradiology, where you can actually send images or share images, um, get opinions from colleagues, you know, uh, or based on what they, they, they see in those images. And now let me narrow down to where we are you know, as uh, the universe teaching hospitals in terms of medical imaging. Well, some of the things have been implemented, like I, ha I have said, like we are also trying to follow what is happening world over. So we see that uh, we have done partial digitization of our systems. So we have both digital, but we still have analog um, systems. Um, we are able to do teleradiology, um, with um, a cloud um, PAX system that is based in uh, Zimbabwe. We also have um, uh, teleradiology sessions with uh, some hospitals in India. So uh, we are able to do uh, teleradiology. I think that is a plus on our, on our part. We are also able to do interventional radiology, as I mentioned that uh, our CAT lab we are able to do intervention to intervene in quite a number of cases. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, most of the systems remain largely isolated for us. We do not have um, a radiology information system. We don't have a PATH system. And so we still have to do a physical transfer and storage of images. You can see in the photos here, which have been inserted, this is uh, in our library up here, we see that we are able, we are still, you know, dealing with analog, uh, you know, imaging, and these are patients' films that are kept in the library. Now, you can imagine the tedious work that I will have if I have the patient that comes in, I do an x-ray, but this patient has had an x-ray done before, and I want to refer to it to see what has changed from the last time to date called interval changes. Very, very important in radiology. You can't do without that. So you have a headache to actually flip through all these, you know, envelopes to find uh, your patient's uh, case. Very, very difficult. 
Um, apart from that, I mean, we also do store images like on uh, CDs uh, like this. Um, we have to back up, and this is a way of backing up. By law, the hospital is supposed to keep uh, patients' images or patients' information for a minimum of about uh, three years. So you see uh, the challenge that we may actually face with having to back up all the patients that we see in the hospital. And not only that, in order to save space, you may put maybe five uh, patients' examinations on one CD. So in order to really find uh, a patient's previous study to refer to, it becomes a, a really, really big challenge. This uh, photo just shows um, uh, the reporting room where we are. We can see that uh, we still have image interpretation in the analog. Others are still uh, looking at um, images in the digital way on computers. These are not specialized uh, uh, monitors for viewing medical images, but we have to make do with what we have. So having said that, uh, just want to quickly talk about some of the challenges then that we face, um, uh, I mean, generally in, in, you know, medical imaging as regards to advancement due to computer technology advancement. Really, there's an increasing cost, both for the patients and the imaging centers and, uh, uh, and institutions, you know. Um, because of uh, the increasing demand for uh, increasing demand for uh, examinations, we find that uh, now we we have most of the patients having to be recommended for for scanning, and um, we find that <laughs> it becomes a cost because we need to. Uh, make sure that uh, the patients uh, have the images and at the same time we also need to uh, uh, make sure that we, we do the cost sharing like we do it in, in the department and then there's an increasing number of you know study volumes here i've put an inset of uh, um, a, an author who gave an example of for example how much information you can store on a 60 gb uh, storage, you know, uh, we find that according to this, if you have 500 images of a CT scan, you can actually put 228 studies on a uh, 60 GB. Unfortunately, that is not the case for us uh, because uh, we image on average about 50 patients per day on average. And apart from that, we see that uh, there is um, an increase in the number of studies that we do. We don't get uh, 500 images. We get, uh, on average, about 1,500 image images uh, on one study. So that tremendously reduces the number of uh, cases that you can store on a 60 GB. This I put in just to make you have a feel that there's a huge demand for you know storage uh, uh, in, in in our department based on this. Um, my apologies, let me just connect my charger. I think I'm running off out of power, sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, so partly, we also see that there's an increase in the number of volumes of uh, images that are being generated simply because well, this is harsh to say, but uh, there are more clinical indications that are coming up, and we've seen that the, clean, the physicians that are being trained now, there's, you know, slowly that art of examination is dying. So they quickly refer patients for examinations rather than excluding, uh, you know, problems based on their clinical skills. Simply by examining a patient, they should be able to come up with a diagnosis. But that art in medicine is slowly dying. And so more and more people are being subject to these um, examinations for the purpose of diagnosis. So hence, you know, the requirement for large volumes of uh, storage capacity, okay? 
But th what this means is that uh, there's an increase in radiation exposure to the patients. We are talking about uh, um, ionizing radiation. Okay, ionizing radiation is dangerous. And I think um, we know that uh, exposure to radiation, yes, uh, is, is there everywhere where you are. But combined with medical exposure, it becomes significant. And these um, things that can actually, um, you know, make people, uh, you know, get susceptible to developing cancers, you know, in, in, in the late years of their, of their lives. So the other thing is an issue of data security concerns. Because some, nowadays we have PAC systems that are, are cloud managed. You could be running an imaging unit here in Zambia, but your images are saved somewhere else in India, you know, uh, cloud uh, storage. All those things are issues of concern, whether us in Africa, us in Zambia, uh, if we can manage, you know, to handle such problems because we are dealing with patients' information that is uh, uh, private and confidential. The challenges that we face generally are those that have outlined here. But there are peculiar problems or challenges that we face at the investing hospitals. And uh, these include the cost to upgrade, you know. Uh, world over, things are changing. They are becoming, you know, complete, uh, completely digitized. For us to completely digitize, there's a huge cost um, involved to that. And then there's also an issue of human resource. At the moment, we have very few radiologists. We have very few technologists, especially in um, uh, computer technology. Um, I might be wrong on that. I think you have better you know, statistics on that. Uh, but also on the issue of training, uh, both medical doctors and radiologists in training do not undergo very good intensive training in computer technology. So it becomes a challenge to manage these resources, uh, even when they are available. Sometimes you may find that uh, you underutilize the equipment that you have simply because of um, not having very good knowledge on computer technology because all the systems now are you know, based on uh, computer technology. Then we have support systems. We need to have support systems. We need to have stable, you know, uh, uh, internet, you know, we need to have stable local area networks. We need to have, you know, stable electricity supply from the peripheries to make these systems uh, uh, run. So these are some of the peculiar, uh, you know, problems or challenges that as at UTH we are facing. Um, apart from the general problems that are being faced world over. But there are opportunities, like here in Zambia, and these opportunities, I want to emphasize that they are open to radiologists, clinicians or physicians, software and hardware engineers like you, uh, the private sector. We are supposed to, uh, you know, the good thing is that we have all these, you know, around in the country. Um, it is these people that I've mentioned above that should be able to develop some cost-effective tools to be able to provide in, indigenous, uh, you know, solutions to the problems that we are facing. Just about uh, some, you know, two or three weeks ago, I was in the ultrasound and um, room and uh, one of the clinicians came uh, who had a patient with a thyroid tumor. Uh, his approach was he wanted to know how vascular the thyroid tumor was. Now, as a, as a, as, as a sonographer, I'm able to subjectively say that uh, this tumor has normal blood vessels or it has less blood vessels or it has more blood vessels, and that is qualitative. There's nothing quantitative to it because he believes that he can actually treat that tumor based on the quantity of vascularity that the tumor has. So he asked me, is there a way you can quantify how much vascularity this tumor has? I, I said I couldn't. 
So perhaps maybe one of you who knows could actually come up with that, you know, some software that could be used to quantify how much vascularity is in a structure or in a, in, in a tumor or in a lesion, whatever it may be. And these are you know, the solutions that we need to see locally. Perhaps I think it could be cheaper for us to find local uh, solutions. The other opportunity that we have is that at the moment we have the government's wide area network that is running in the hospitals. Unfortunately, not very stable, but um, it's there. And uh, I think also one of the most important uh, opportunities we have is the political will that we have from the leadership of the country, of the government, uh, for us to even get to a point where we have digital equipment to have uh, state-of-the-art equipment like uh, uh, the CAT lab, you know, it, it shows that there's political will from, from the government to be able to lift ourselves from where we are and move uh, together with the world. And these are the strong, you know, um, uh, polit um, points where we could actually uh, fall back on in order to solve some of, all, of the challenges that we are facing. What's the future in terms of in terms of uh, medical imaging? Is that the future is as open as the computer technology is? I mean, the, we are seeing computer technology advancing, and along with that, medical imaging will 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 will, will advance. It's completely open, and it's a, an open challenge to all of us. What is it that we can also do? What else is it that we can do uh, to improve medical imaging? from where we are to areas where we have uh, uh, more, you know, like benefits for the patient and everything should be centered on the patient. Uh, for the future, I just want to quickly talk about this issue of, uh, there has been uh, quite a number of uh, talks where people have debated whether artificial intelligence, intelligence will take over the radiologist job the answer to that question still remains a no and a yes, because we know that computer technology and artificial intelligence, machine learning could actually be more accurate than the human eye in terms of interpreting pathology. It can be able to see what the radiologist eye cannot, but at the same time, it's a no because we always need the radiologist to correlate what is seen in the images with what the patient has. And that job cannot be taken away uh, from the radiologist. So usually that comes up and uh, we remain at yes and no. Okay. So I know I might have taken more than what I should in more time than I should, but in my concluding remarks, I want to say that radiology and medical imaging are components of the you know, health sector, health industry, that is heavily dependent on um, the rapidly evolving computer technology. And where, you know, these systems of radiology information systems and parks have been implemented, reports have been given that these have benefited the patients as well as the imaging centers. So industrial collaborations, what we need are industrial collaborations between clinicians, radiologists, uh, you know, computer technologists like uh, you as our colleagues to actually put our minds together to try and improve on the areas where we are lagging behind in terms of uh, the imaging systems. Um, just want to mention that I got a few of the material in the abstract. Um, from these two uh, sources that I've indicated here. And I also want to acknowledge that the photo insights uh, are from the Department of Radiology at the University Teaching Hospitals, Adult Hospital, and also the Cancer Disease Hospital. And um, the background uh, image for the slides is a courtesy of the Telerad tape. Uh, I thank you. I will end my talk here. In case there are any questions, please uh, are feel free to come in. Well, wow, that was uh, quite quite a mouthful, and thank you so much. Uh, we yeah. really appreciate it. And I don't think we really 
uh, went beyond that at the time. <laughs> there was an issue of the technical glitch. But be before yeah. I lose my train of thought, right, a couple of things here. Uh, most of the stuff you were talking about is completely new to me. But I just wanted yeah. to highlight to do with, um, I mean, you, you brought up things that most people attending this meeting will consider trivial, or space, uh, connectivity. I'm, I'm happy to say we have two people that are in attendance. Uh, I think there's a Mr. Christopher Lewis, who happens to be the vice president of uh, ICTAS, right? Um, and I think there's a treasurer as well with uh, Milimo Munyati. And incidentally, both of these people are going to be giving talks in the next coming weeks. Um, it would be nice if maybe we can perhaps uh, carry on this conversation um, and try and identify people we can engage to try and see how we can help. Uh, I know that uh, we have the so-called Zambia National Data Center. I mean, if we have that platform, why do we have to store data on servers in India, right? Um, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of uh, questions, I was writing down things here, but I'll open the floor to whoever has questions and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll speak somewhere towards the end or something. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, if you have questions, just feel free to mute your mic um, and then ask away. Uh, uh, Christopher Milimo, thank you so much for coming through. Thank you, thank you. If, if people have questions, maybe you can ask away or something. Surely there are questions here, right? I, I saw some people that we worked with in uh, CS, I mean, CS, CS 5741 from last year. Surely when Enes was talking about AI, maybe you have questions to do with, uh, you know, what sort of uh, so-called uh, supervised learning techniques we can employ to try and help them out. I'm sure people have questions here. The, the floor is open, please ask. 